for this pig. And they hanged him. And they hanged the piglet. Um, in another case, there was a guy who was accused of this, and his name was Thomas Hogg, H-O-G-G. Um, and you wonder, the resemblance uh, was maybe in the name in addition to um, in the faces. So th this is not um, you know, something small. Like they, they actually thought this was a big problem. They were outlawing any kind of activity they thought flew in the face of God's design for a perfect life, um, society. And then, as you can see with these biological impossibilities of pigs being fathered by human-animal relations, um, they were trying so strongly to stick with those laws that they um, even ended up forcing people into false confessions. That's going to come back when we look at the witches. Okay, so Puritan leaders, they felt threatened by people of other Christian religions. Puritans were a form of Christianity. They, that's what they, um, they were one sect of Christianity. But they did not like the other sects of Christianity. They, they um, wanted to create their own uniform society in America. So um, one misconception is that Puritans wanted religious toleration. They wanted a place where anyone could practice their religion freely. They, they absolutely did not. Their laws said that there could not be the, the other practices of religion. They, there could only be the Puritan form of Christianity. They told Catholics, of course, to go away, because Catholics had not even subscribed to the Reformation. They weren't Protestants at all. But they also told Anglicans to keep away Baptists, Quakers. Those were all Protestant forms of Christianity that you would expect them not to have a big problem with, or expect a Protestant religion not to have such a problem with. But the, the Puritans had gone to America specifically to create a Puritan-only society. So when they talked about religious freedom, they meant their own freedom. They didn't mean the freedom for anybody else to practice their versions. They, uh, so one person said at the time, they have free liberty to keep away from us. That's what the religious freedom was uh, in, in their minds. They said, they can go, they can start their own colony somewhere else, but do not come and pollute this Puritan society we're creating. So they had a lot of rules and laws, building up their defenses against Satan, building up their godly society, but they also had rules that outlawed things that they saw as distracting them or tearing them down. Okay, so, but what did they do economically? Um, well, if we do our usual turning of the map, because they drew all their maps sideways, because of course they're coming from across the Atlantic Ocean, so it doesn't look like North America anymore to us, but from their perspective they're coming from England, and that map is kind of messed up there. Okay. So, and so here's Boston, uh, kind of in the middle here. And here's Cape Cod, the prominent feature of, of, of New England. And what, um, what you might notice is that they settled in a lot of towns. The town of Springfield, the town of Woolburn. They are settling in places in compact settlements rather than spreading out on farms. And they're doing this because they, they wanted to um, have defense against Native American attacks. We'll get to that on Friday, the, the wars. Um, they wanted to keep an eye on each other as well. They wanted to um, make sure their neighbors were living moral lives. They were looking out for the next you know, piglet lookalike. They were looking out for people who were not acting neighborly, that were um, just uh, hoarding too much material wealth, things like that. So they were watching each other's morality, making sure that they were following that godly lifestyle. And then also they wanted their children to go to school because they had those schools where 
teaching them reading would get them uh, get, get the children access to the Bible earlier, or at all. It would be really unusual for a woman to be able to read um, in Europe. Above all, they also got access to a safe, uh, or excuse me, they got access to a convenient local church so that they could um, attend all of those sermons, those 7,000 sermons I talked about. So the town ended up being the local form of government. You might say, don't people live in towns normally? Not necessarily. We compare it back to Virginia from last week. Virginia was an agricultural society. They were growing a lot of tobacco. They were relying on slave labor. Um, and the more, if you wanted to make more money, the key was to spread out, to get access to more land, to take it from Native Americans through warfare. We saw that last week. And so individuals would hold huge tracts of land, and they would farm it, or they would direct the farming of it, and um, they would live on it, and they would be spread out throughout the countryside from each other. So there weren't really towns in Virginia. There was Jamestown, okay, because that, that was the fort where they first settled. Eventually, there was Norfolk, a port. There was Williamsburg. But that's it, basically. I mean, that's really all there was at first. And so the, the local government, if you sued somebody in Virginia, you didn't go to a town court, or you didn't um, rely on like a town policing force. It was always the county level. The counties were huge, too. And the counties would meet once a month um, for a court day at a, at a courthouse. But it was only once a month. So there wasn't really like a, a tradition in Virginia of people seeing each other on the street every day and, um, and, and, and bumping into each other. Whereas in New England, they, they lived in towns, you can think of them as kind of like college campuses because here it's that same kind of feel where you walk around from place to place. It's, um, I mean, these are larger, a campus is larger than a town, but um, it would be what a city would be like. And they would, um, they would go down the street and bump into each other and watch each other's behavior and go to school and go to church, and they would see each other. And they did that on purpose. They really wanted to do that on purpose. When they did have a farm, it would... Um, I don't have my map of, of an actual town plot, but um, the houses would be kind of next to each other in town, and then fanning out on the outskirts of town were all the farmlands. And so you'd live in town, and then you'd go, you'd walk out of town to go to your farmland and work it, and then you'd come back and your house would be in town. There were also farm houses out in the countryside, but the town was the privileged um, site of where people would want to live. Um, so Puritans, they weren't out to make a buck, really. They, were, they weren't trying to make a huge profit. So um, we can compare slavery as well, that slavery was very, very minimal in New England in the 17th century. It grew in the 18th century, but uh, if we're looking at the Puritans who first migrated, they because they weren't doing cash crop farming, like tobacco, rice, sugar that we talked about, um, they didn't turn to racial slavery as quickly or, or as, as um, easily. So we can compare New England population. Only 2% of the population in New England was enslaved, whereas 13% of the Virginia and Chesapeake population was enslaved in the 17th century. It's still an early period, so the number is fairly low. And it, well, it seems low on the Chesapeake, but the whole organization of society was around that. And then add on top of the 13% racial chattel slavery that there were also the indentured servants that were in the big portion. And then you look at the Caribbean, another territory we looked at last week, growing sugar. 78% of its population was enslaved in the, as early as the 17th century. All of these numbers went up uh, in the 18th century. But we're looking at that 17th century early moment, and it really shows you 
that the emphasis was different in New England. They, they were not looking for that economic advantage as much. Instead, they had family farms. The soil was rocky. The climate was cold. The growing season was short. So people didn't grow those tobacco and sugar and rice type crops. They couldn't grow it. They didn't want to anyway. They had big families for labor instead. They had six or seven children who survived to adulthood. And they would rely on those six or seven sons or daughters to do the work. The family was the main source of labor. OK, so you have a sense of how they're setting up the rules of society, how they're making a living. They're making just enough to survive. They're not really trying to make a huge profit. In fact, they get suspicious of someone who makes too much money. They think that person is, you know, their priorities are in the wrong place, or maybe they've made a pact with the devil. They, they do, um, when they go on a witch hunt, they tend to target people who have more income than it seems they really should. They, they say, where does that all that money come from? All right, so you have a sense of the foundations of society. But let, let's look now more at those internal disputes that I talked about earlier. I mentioned this um, being something that they didn't like, but was kind of inevitable. It's because they all agreed that the Bible was the basis of society. The Bible should be the, the fundamental thing you build your whole society on. But the Bible is a text, and individuals who read it can disagree about how to interpret it. Disagree about what the words really mean, or where the emphasis should be. And so they argued about what godly laws should look like, or what policies should look like. And the stakes to them seemed really high, because they thought that the fate of humanity rested with New England's success in pleasing God, in creating that city of honor hill. So I'm going to do a couple of examples of this. One is from a woman named Anne Hutchinson. She, was, she came in the Great Migration in the 1630s, that big wave of Puritan immigrants that went to Boston. And when she got to Boston, she started to lead some prayer meetings in her home. And hundreds of people went to her house for these prayer meetings that she led. And those hundreds of people became her followers. She got a lot of influence over them. Now, she was, a, um, in, a she was in agreement fundamentally with the idea that um, only God could save somebody's soul. That was a Puritan belief, and she was in line with mainstream Puritan thought. Only God could save somebody's soul, she said. In other words, if somebody wanted to go to heaven, there was nothing they could do about getting there. They, they either were going to go or they weren't, and they had no control over it. Even if they volunteered a lot, gave a lot of their money to the poor, you know, did did what you would consider to be Christian acts of charity, or if they prayed a lot, a lot of additional worship wouldn't do anything to change their faith, that God had already decided whether or not they were going to heaven. This was a Puritan belief. And what they usually did is they looked around in town and they said, um, well, this person seems like they're probably going to heaven, They've probably been chosen by God because look at how they live their life. They pray a lot. They are successful in business, but not too successful. They're making a respectable um, amount of uh, you know, food at the farm. They have a good family. And cord like the, the, there's um, cordiality among the people in the family. Nobody's arguing. So they would look for signs, by, they would inspect each other in order to try to guess what God's fate was for somebody. All right, so she agreed with that. That was normal Puritan thought. 
where she got into hot water was that she said the leaders of the colony, the ministers, the, the people in government, were falsely identifying the people who were probably saved. She said those ministers, when they point to somebody and say that person's probably on the way to heaven, they're wrong. And specifically, she thought that the ministers themselves were in severe danger of damnation. She said that they were godless hypocrites, they were being dangerous to the fates of everyone's souls because they were misleading everyone else in the colony when trying to identify who was saved and who was damned. That, that's the theology that got her into trouble. Also, she was a woman, and this was not a society where women had leadership positions. So there was something about gender going on, too. We can even, you don't have to take my word for it, you can, you can hear it from the governor of Massachusetts, John Winthrop. He, he saw her, he knew she was a threat to the, to the social order. Um, because a woman came into the courtroom at her trial. Like, so she, uh, Anne Hutchinson is a woman, she walks into the courtroom to defend herself. And she holds her own in a theological debate against the leading ministers of the colony, including John Winthrop. He's the most educated men in the colony. And she, she gets into a theological debate, and she makes a lot of sense in what she's saying. And so Winthrop kind of tips his hand when he says, you have stepped out of your place. You have rather been a husband than a wife. He says she's acting like a man. When, it, when she should act more like a woman. And in Puritan society, that meant be more of a receiver of information rather than someone who steps up as a leader. He says, you've been um, more like a, rather a husband than a wife, a preacher than a hearer, and a magistrate than a subject. He says, she has been too much of a leader, a preacher, too much of, like a man and she should be more submissive. So those are his direct words, and so he's kind of tipping there that she's not only preaching supposedly incorrect things, but she's, she shouldn't be preaching at all, or she shouldn't have followers. She shouldn't be leading um, prayer meetings at her home. So based on that, but also especially or the legal record based on her claiming to have direct insight into Christianity that bypassed even the Bible. She claimed to have some powers of prophecy. She was expelled in 1637. So, I'm just checking my time and looking at what I want to do. Okay, I think we're good on time. So she's expelled in 1637, and um, she goes to a different colony, Rhode Island. Rhode Island even existed at all because someone else had been expelled already from Massachusetts. Roger Williams had been expelled on his own for his own dispute with the Puritans in Massachusetts, with their government. His view was there shouldn't be a connection between religion and government. He was still, and he considered himself a, a Protestant, a, um, a Christian, but he thought that the religion would always be corrupted if there was a connection to government. So he had been expelled and he went down to a place that hadn't been settled yet by Europeans and created the town of Providence. And that became a place of religious toleration where he actually did the thing that Puritans never did, which was allowed everyone to come in, almost everyone, not Catholics, because he was a Protestant and he did not want um, Catholics. Protestants and Catholics is the big divide in the Christian world. 
Among the Protestants, though, he accepted all Protestants, Baptists, Quakers, um, even non-Christians he accepted. He accepted Jews to come and live and worship um, in their own way without any interference from the government at all. He didn't require anybody to go to a particular church. He didn't require anyone to have a certain faith in order to vote. In other colonies, there were rules. You had to be this religion or that religion if you, if you were going to have the right to vote. Here, he said, no, everybody gets to vote regardless of going to a specific church. He kept that strict separation between church and state. He also had one of the most democratic governments where there was a lot of representation of the people who lived there. So this is where Anne Hutchinson went when she was expelled from Massachusetts. To, to a place that was more like a, it was like, um, it was a really helpful place because it took anyone who was expelled from anywhere else. There was a magnet for dissenters, a magnet for people who just like disagreed with whatever government they were fleeing from. And so she left Boston and went down here and she settled. She, she moved on afterward down to New York. Um, but Rhode Island was a haven for people like her or for anyone who was not welcome among the Puritans. So if, you, if you're thinking of New England as a place of religious toleration, the only place that actually happened was the town of Providence in what would later become the tiny state of Rhode Island. The rest of this was all, all of these Puritan settlements were very intolerant, even of each other, to the point where in one of those towns that they liked to live in, sometimes it would just literally split in half. And people would follow the old minister, or stay with the old minister, and other people would join a new minister, go leave, form a brand new town somewhere else. And that's how a lot of the settlement of New England happened. Towns just splitting apart. But then that new town had its own orthodoxy, we call it. Orthodoxy, the um, staying you know, strictly with the rules that are put in force by the people of power. So that's happening in most of New England, but Rhode Island is that exception. That's why all of the dissenters like Anne Hutchinson, all of the rebels end up in Rhode Island. So it was really helpful to Massachusetts to have a place to push all of its people out to, all the people who were challenging them. Okay, the other enemy within society wasn't just Anne Hutchinson or Roger Williams. It was ordinary neighbors, witches. I, I gave you a little bit of information about them last week. I'm going to expand on that now so that you are prepared to read your primary sources for the next Monday discussion section. You're going to be reading trials of two witches, little, little tiny pieces of those trials. Um, of two people who were accused of being witches. So I'm going to give you um, some more information. All right, so for one thing, it was normal at the time to believe in magic and to believe in astrology and to think witchcraft was real. For um, an average person back in Europe, yes, they went to church, Yes, they considered themselves Christian, or if they considered themselves Christian, they would also turn to magic if they really needed to. Because sometimes they were desperate. Their child developed a fever, and they would turn and try to use every tool they possibly could. And they weren't paying as much attention anymore to the strict orthodoxy that was required of them by priests and the leaders of society. So average ordinary people would say, hey, doesn't that woman down the street have a reputation for being a witch? Maybe I'll go ask her for some help. And they would go, they would pay her some money, and she would give them maybe a concoction, maybe she would say a few words in order to, to try to help heal the child. 
What that woman was doing was making a little money on her reputation. For whatever reason, she'd been singled out as someone who might be a witch. And she cashed in on it. All right, so that's normal back in Europe. Well, we're not in Europe here. <laughs> this is New England that we're talking about today. And the Puritans who went to New England, they were more suspicious of witches, but they did believe they existed. So they were sometimes less willing to turn to a witch's help, but they still believed there really were people out there called witches. They thought that these witches were the most direct recruits of Satan. That Satan went out and, and recruited women from um, within the community to try to undermine that community. He would get them to sign that book um, in Satan's in, in his blood, um, giving Satan their eternal soul, souls. Excuse me. They signed Satan's book in their own blood and then um, they would give Satan their eternal souls, and in return, Satan gave them the power to kill or to harm. This was the belief that Puritans had, or really that lots of people had, that it was possible to do that. Now, witches back in Europe, they, they had the power to heal as well as, as to harm. Um, the two are kind of both sides, the two sides of a coin. But in New England, they see it a little bit differently because they think Satan is always out to try to tear down their society. So they see witches as a real threat. Most witches, or most, acute, most people accused of being a witch were women. 80% of the accused were women. Um, and usually, they were middle-aged women. Middle-aged women who were defying gender norms in some way. Should sound familiar. Defying gender norms was part of what got Anne Hutchinson into trouble. Now, she wasn't labeled a witch, but she was doing the same thing, stepping outside of the boundaries society had put for her um, as a woman. Now, how did they defy their gender norms when they were accused of being witches? They would maybe be economically independent. So if their husband died and they became a widow, and they inherited the farm or the tavern or whatever it was, and they were making money on their own because they were now the adult in charge of the household, the, the sole parent, the, the sole elder, um, then they were economically independent of men. And that was unusual in the society. It was frowned upon. Um, it, um, it was a, 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 wasn't a crossing of explicit boundaries, but it was unusual for them to see it. Some other way that they would defy a gender norm would be if they fought a lot with their husbands. Now, it didn't put the husband in trouble as much, but um, it put them in trouble for being outspoken about it. Um, so it's, if some family was reputed to, or reputed to have a lot of arguments, then people would start to think that maybe um, there was a witch in the family. Or if a woman went out into the street in town and was just more outspoken than others, to straight, to not strangers, but to neighbors, or said things to neighbors that were um, just unusual or weird, just that you wouldn't normally hear. They professed too much affection for a neighbor. I saw it in a source the other day. If they weren't friendly enough to a neighbor, they didn't, if they didn't live up to that ideal of neighborliness in that town, they could end up being accused of being a witch. Usually it was more than one of these things would kind of come together and weave together into the accusation. So 80% of accused people were women, 20% were men. They also defied gender norms. A man accused of being a witch might be someone who allowed his wife too much freedom or too much independence or someone who made too much money. All right. so. They're, they're violating norms of gender, of neighborliness, of what it meant to be a, a good Puritan. The 
maybe surprising thing, because it sounds like women are getting targeted, the surprising thing is that the majority of accusers were, were women as well. Women accused women of being witches. And it might sound surprising because you think, oh, wouldn't, if this is about a woman not acting like a woman, it sounds like that's the man's agenda is to get women to act a certain way. But no, other women in society also believed in those gender norms and did not want them violated. So it's, it's not women versus men. It's people who are in line with the values of that society versus the ones who are kind of stepping out a little bit from, from them. So most accusers were women. Those women accused other women of being witches when they violated norms. And then if, um, if someone developed a reputation and then enough weird incidents occurred, like cattle died or children got sick, people in New England believed that um, someone in their midst was secretly a witch and, hey, there's someone in town who has a reputation for arguing a lot with her husband, for saying strange things when you meet her in the street. And they try to identify that person, prosecute them, and neutralize the witch. Usually the, the prosecution was sporadic and individualized. One woman would get accused, and she would go on trial. Her neighbors would swear to, to, to events that happened, like we do in a courtroom today. They, they would put it down in depositions. This is what a deposition looks like. A deposition is a legal document. There's a typed up version of this exact one that you'll be reading for Monday's class. And what a deposition was, um, it was sworn, it was legal, but it also contained a lot of little stories of everyday life. But basically, neighbors would, would go and say, well, I was walking down the street one day when she was coming toward me, and all of a sudden the wheel popped off my cart, and my, and my cart fell apart. And there was no rut in the road, there was no hole, I just performed maintenance on it, so they tell a story like that, which has a lot of like very specific details in it. And this was sworn to and entered into the legal record with a deposition, and it would become evidence against her that weird things happened when she was around. These are really good sources because lots of times ordinary people did not write books or they did not write diaries. And so sometimes the only place we get their words recorded for historians is when they show up in the courtroom and they have to swear to what happened the other day on the street. Especially women did not tend to write down their own thoughts. And so when women give a deposition against another woman for being a witch, it's like gold to a historian because it gives you a little picture of what everyday interactions could be like. It's like, I mean, think of it this way. You couldn't just, if you have a witch trial going on and a neighbor wants to accuse someone, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, she's a witch. You can't, they can't just walk in and say, she's a witch. They can't just say that. That's not enough. <laughs> they needed to prove it. They need, the court would say, show us. How do you know she's a witch? And so that's when the neighbor needed to explain the everyday situation uh, that made them think she was a witch. That's why these are long. These are stories where the neighbor says, well, let's say, like, the modern day. I was walking to class when suddenly you know, she emerged from a bush, and that's a weird place to be. I don't see many students emerging from bushes. Or I was hanging out with my usual group of friends at dinner one night. When suddenly I saw. And so you get those stories of everyday life with a little weird wrinkle to it, and that's how, and that weird wrinkle is why they care enough to write it down. So, what would normally happen is this would happen to one woman, she'd be accused of being a witch, and then 
Lots of neighbors would write these depositions accusing her. And then if she confessed, then they often pardoned her and tried to kind of fold her back into the community. But if she did not confess, if she persisted in denying the charge, they sentenced her to hanging. So often you get a woman who was convicted or who confessed to being a witch, who, who then got to live, but had to have the reputation for the rest of her life. And she might get accused again later on. She might try to make a little money off her reputation to any neighbors who were in dire straits and needed a little extra um, help in saving a sick child or something like that. So Mary Parsons, whose deposition I'm showing you here, is one of the cases that you're going to be looking at for Monday's class. She lived in Connecticut, and when her neighbor accused her of being a witch, she sued that neighbor for slander. She said, you are lying about me. That's slander. I am not a witch. And the slander lawsuit brought out a pile of suspicions that people had that she might be a witch. And so she's saying, you're, you're spreading falsehoods about me. And everyone else said, no, we're not. And they all came out and said, here are all the weird things you've been doing. So you're reading the depositions from this early stage. This is from 1656, when Mary Parsons was suing her neighbors for lying about her and ruining her reputation. Now you're going to notice that there's some strange terminology. You're going to see the word good man or good wife show up a lot. Good wife or goody, for short, was just a way that you addressed somebody. Elites were called master or mistress. Um, ordinary people were called goody, good wife or goodman. So don't get thrown off. They're not all, they don't all have the same first name. That's a title. It's like Mr., Doctor, Professor, things like that. You're also going to read a document from Salem in 1692. Now, what happened in Salem, um, now the trials, they, they occurred in this house. This was the house of one of the judges, and he just held the trials in the house. Um, is several girls and young women went into fits and had nightmares. And they explained their fits by accusing at first three witches, including an Indian slave from the Caribbean who lived in the home of one of the girls. The only way for those three accused witches to save themselves from being executed was to confess the names of other witches. So you can imagine how that spread. Three people are encouraged to each accuse two or three more people, and so that's many, many um, accusations spreading around. So you'll be reading the summary of evidence against one of the witches that was written up by this man, it's from this book. And it's going to be a summary of the evidence against her. It won't be the depositions themselves, but it'll be um, him um, giving an overview so it's easier for you to understand and it's uh, you get more examples from him. All right, how did Salem end? Well, 19 men and women were hanged, and a 20th was crushed to death by stones. But because there was a lot of accusations going up the food chain, all the way up to the wife of the governor, in fact. They eventually shut it down. They said, we can't have any more people accusing each other of being witches. Afterwards, everybody was embarrassed by this fiasco. New Englanders generally no longer want, wanted to go on witch hunts after this event. Prominent men accelerated their commitment to scientific exploration. Um, they explained natural events as natural and scientific occurrences. Things like comets and illnesses were no longer as supernatural to them. They didn't say it was all magic and the devil. They instead tended to say that um, they needed to explore scientifically to figure out what was going on. It took going through this tragic event for them um, to finally realize um, that the witch hunt was 
really socially constructed. It was something that a lot of people um, were just taking their belief systems uh, and putting them into these sometimes deadly um, engines of um, uh, rooting out some neighbor who was acting their part. Okay, so um, that's it for today. Um, we're going to look at New England and Native American relations on Friday. So we're looking at um, outside from Puritan society on Friday. And then in Monday's class, we're going to be doing the witches.